Lincoln. I did a book about Ab Abraham Lincoln some years ago, focusing on Lincoln's management of the Navy. Now, a lot of people know of Abraham Lincoln as a war manager, the most terrible war in American history, uh, and, and a terrible burden to anyone who sits in the presidential chair. Um, but very few people have talked about him as a manager of the naval war, so that's what I wanted to do. And I want to use that as a vehicle to explore leadership in general, and particularly his. And one of the things I do as a collateral duty is I sit on a committee that rates the presidents historically over the years. Uh, and in every year since we've been doing this, which is more than 30, um, there are three people who always congregate at the top of that list. Can you tell me who they are? This guy is one. The other two? Say it again. George Washington is always on the list and FDR, Franklin Roosevelt. They, they change places once in a while, uh, but it's almost always those three, and usually with this guy at the top. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the characteristics that explain that. What was it about Abraham Lincoln that gave him the skill, the temperament to be the man who is considered to be the greatest American president? Because after all, he had very little experience. He had no executive experience. His only political activity was a single term as a congressman in the 1840s. And other than that, he'd never been governor, never been senator. Um, so what was it about him? What characteristics did he have to make him successful? This is my favorite photograph of him. This was taken in 1863. It's only two weeks away from the Gettysburg Address, probably his most famous public speech. Um, and already you can see he's 53 years old, by the way, and he looks, I don't know, older. Um, but um, when he became president, he had very little to go on in terms of what were his responsibilities as Commander-in-Chief. There's almost nothing in the Constitution to help him out. Article 1, Section 1 says, the President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy. Period. But it doesn't say what that means. Um, the infrastructure was tiny. The Navy itself was relatively tiny. So Lincoln kind of had to make it up as he went along. Uh, and I think the fact that he was able to do that so successfully tells us a lot about him. I'm going to talk about three episodes uh, in his presidency in dealing with the Navy, each of which I think will illuminate a particular aspect of his character, personality, and leadership style. And the first of those took place relatively early in the war, and it concerned this man, who is Charles Wilkes, not a household name, then or now. Charles Wilkes was most famous, perhaps, for being the commanding officer of what was known as the Great United States Exploring Expedition from 1838 to 1842. Um, these were times, first couple of decades of the 19th century, when navies, for a change, were not at war with one another and looking, I suppose, for something to do in an age of scientific exploration. Remember, this is the age of Darwin on the Beagle. Congress authorized funds for an American scientific exploring expedition. And they offered it to all the senior captains in the Navy at the time, saying, well, you're going to be gone for about three or four years, sailing all the way around the world, picking up, you know, fossils and birds and flora and fauna. Uh, and one by one, all the senior captains turned it down. For some reason, they just didn't think that sounded like something they wanted to do. But Lieutenant Charles Wilkes said, sure, I'll take that on, I'll do that. The difficulty was that Charles Wilkes was kind of a martinet uh, as a commander. Uh, there were nearly incipient mutinies on several of the ships he commanded. There were five ships altogether on this expedition. Um, you know in town how they sell these t-shirts that say the floggings will continue until morale improves. I think that came from his command tenure that that idea was born. Well, it was more or less a successful tour in other respects. They did bring back uh, thousands of scientific uh, examples, rocks, plants, animals, stuffed and living, uh, which formed the, the uh, core exhibit at what became the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, he's also the individual who discovered 
that Antarctica is in fact a continent. And if you look on atlases when you get home, you'll find that about a third of the coastline of Antarctica is still called Wilkes Land, which he modestly named for himself. Um, but the reason he intersected with Abraham Lincoln is that early in the war, Charles Wilkes, uh, because of his, I think, poor management style, uh, had been relegated to the sidelines of the Navy. When the war began in 1861, for example, he was chairman of the Lighthouse Board. But during a war, the Navy needed all of its officers. He was recalled to active service and given command of the USS San Jacinto, named for the battle in Texas that took place in the 1830s. And his assignment in command of that was to go to uh, Norfolk and join up with a squadron being prepared for an ex expedition against the South. But to a man like Charles Wilkes, orders were suggestions, you know, advisory. And he thought he had a better idea. Because he had learned, as had most of the country, that the Confederacy had appointed two men uh, named Mason and Slidell, Charles Murray Mason and John Slidell. I think I've got them here too. There they are. Um, to be the Confederate ambassadors to Britain and France. And they had embarked uh, on a ship and escaped out through the blockade and made their way to Cuba. And from Cuba then they booked passage, as regular passengers, on board a British mail packet, the HMS Trent, that was going to carry them to Europe where they would begin their diplomatic tours as representatives of the Confederacy. And, um, Charles Wilkes decided it would be a great feather in his cap if he captured these guys. So he set out for Cuba, orders notwithstanding, and positioned himself in a narrow piece of channel known as the Bahama Narrows so he could pick off the HMS Trent when it came by. And that's exactly what he did. And uh, this is supposedly, it's a newspaper illustration showing the San Jacinto Wilkes' steamer here, and the Trent flying because you see the British flag. And the Trent is not just a passenger ship, it's a mail packet of Her Majesty's government, which gives it a certain status. It's not quite a Royal Navy ship, but the next thing to it. So stopping such a vessel on the high seas and sending a boarding party, which you see here approaching the starboard side, on board ordering the captain of the Trent to muster the crew so he can find these guys, Mason and Slidell. Well, of course, the British captain says, I'll do no such thing, and how dare you stop my ship on the high seas? Who do you think you are? But Mason and Slidell knew this was an opportunity. They stepped forward and said, we are the Confederate ambassadors. What are you going to do about it? And they said, well, come along with us. You're under arrest. No, no, you'll have to carry us off. So sure enough, a group of Marines came, grabbed them by the arm, carried them to the side, down in a longboat, and Wilkes brought them back to the United States. Well, this is hugely popular at home. Northern cities had parades and celebrations. He serenaded at his home, which was on Lafayette Square, right around the corner from the White House, incidentally. Um, so he's a national hero. But it's a problem for Lincoln because he has violated international law. He has stopped a British ship on the high seas, taken passengers off that ship. You know, we went to war with Britain in 1812 for doing something much like this. So now Lincoln finds himself, oh my God, what has this guy done to me? If I say, how dare you, Charles Wilkes, bad, 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 return those men immediately to Britain, his popularity, Lincoln's popularity, plummets because Wilkes is now a national hero. If on the other hand he says, congratulations, Captain Wilkes, here's a medal, he might have to fight a war against Britain. And he's already got his hands full fighting a war against the Confederacy. There's no good out here. So what does Abraham Lincoln do? And here's the answer. Here's our first peek into the character and style of Lincoln's leadership. Here's what he does. Nothing. Sometimes that's not a bad option. Lincoln knew that the enthusiasm of the population that exalted Charles Wilkes for his illegal act would fade. That would dissipate over time. And he didn't know yet how the British were going to react. 
It would take several weeks for news of this to reach London, for them to talk about it, and then for it to come back. You know, on subterranean Atlantic cable had been laid in 1858, but it broke in 1859. So the only communication back and forth across the Atlantic in 1861 was by ship. So this gives him a window of kind of wait and see. And that's exactly what he did. And sure enough, the enthusiasm for Wilkes began to wane a little bit. No more parades, no more serenades. Other news began to supplant it on the newspaper. But when the news came from Britain, in their reaction to this act, it's pretty draconian. Uh, the British cabinet said, uh, we demand an apology. We demand an indemnity. You must return Mason and Slidell and bring them, uh, turn them over to the Royal Navy. Uh, you must admit that you were wrong. Uh, and you must do this immediately or we will recall our ambassador. Now in the 19th century, recalling your ambassador was tantamount to saying breaking diplomatic relations as a first step toward war. It's serious stuff. So Lincoln calls his cabinet together and says, okay guys, we have to figure this out. We have to find a way out of this mess. We clearly can't kowtow to the British who are still despised by a majority of Americans in 1861-62. But on the other hand, if we take a hard stand, we might end up at war. So Lincoln and his Secretary of State, who was William Henry Seward, I love this photograph of Seward, by the way. I have no idea why he chose to be photographed in profile. Um, that was a personal decision, obviously. Um, his, his secretaries, by the way, had a nickname for him. They called him the Great Macaw, whatever. Make of that what you will. Seward and Lincoln together came up with an idea. Here's the way they worked it out. They said, okay, we're going to say to the British, thank you for admitting that we are right. Huh? Because in 1812, when you were taking men off our ships, you defended that as something you were allowed to do, and we went to war to prevent it. But now that you agree that taking men off other ships is illegal and unwarranted, and you admit that we are right, we congratulate you on coming around to our way of viewing things, so of course we'll return Mason and Slidell. Oh, okay, I guess so. It's not exactly an apology, uh, but it worked. Mason and Slidell were turned over to the Royal Navy. They were delivered up to Canada, and from Canada they took passage over to Britain and France where they carried on their various efforts to get Britain and France to recognize the Confederacy, unsuccessfully, of course. But Lincoln survived the moment, which is the key. So that's one example of Lincoln's uh, style. Let me, uh, let me talk about another one. This is another American naval officer. This is John Rogers. Rogers, very famous naval family you may know, almost as famous as the Perrys here in Newport. Uh, John Rogers and his father, uh, who was the John Rogers that commanded the fleet in the War of 1812, and he had a brother, Christopher Raymond Perry Rogers, also very well known. But John Rogers had spent most of his life as a naval officer from the age of about 15 on. And he was a lieutenant when the war broke out because not much promotions in peacetime. But here comes a war, great expansion of the Navy. He's promoted immediately, becomes a commander and then a captain. And he's thinking, oh boy, I'm going to get command of a ship. Heck, I could get command of a fleet. This is going to be amazing. Here comes my career now at last. I'll rival my famous father for heroics. And he got his orders and perhaps with trembling hands opened them up and read that you were hereby ordered to report to Cincinnati, Ohio. <laughs> Not the orders he was looking for. It turned out, of course, in the Civil War, as most of you who followed the Civil War at all may know, that the rivers, the western rivers, particularly the Mississippi, of course, but also the Cumberland, the Tennessee, the Ohio, and other tributaries of the Mississippi, were vital uh, means of transportation and therefore battle sites in the war. And the army out west needed gunpower on the rivers to sustain their mobility, to sustain their supply chain and so forth, and so that was what Rogers was ordered to do. Now the difficulty here is that uh, there wasn't a standing military, excuse me, naval force on the rivers. You wouldn't have thought it necessary in peacetime, but now it is. So there's a lot of creativity that gets involved here, and one of the kinds of vessels um, that Rogers decided was extremely useful in this campaign on the Western Rivers was something called a, this is always hard for me to say, so bear with me here, 
a mortar boat. It's not a motor boat. There's no motor on it. It's a mortar boat. It's a raft with a 13-inch mortar on it, fired a shell about the size of a basketball, a little bigger actually, in a high arcing trajectory with a fuse on it that would land and explode. I mean, you could fire it around the bend of a river, over a mountaintop, up to three miles in range. It's a, it's a very useful weapon. The problem is that in the 19th century, and particularly during the Civil War, the Army and the Navy were utterly separate. I mean, even more than they are on the first Saturday in December these days. <laughs> there was a Secretary of War who supervised the Army and a Secretary of the Navy, both sitting on the cabinet together as co-equals, and they hardly ever spoke to each other. Certainly, the serving forces hardly ever spoke to each other. So, the problem is who's responsible for this? Rogers said, well, we need this thing. It's important. We've got to have it. Um, I, but they're not ships. I mean, look at that. That is not a ship. So I think the Army should pay these guys. It's Army cannoneers. It's an Army piece of ordnance. So the Army should pay for them and maintain them and supervise them. And the Army said, no, 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 no. They float. It's not ours. It's yours. You do it. And if you trace the chain of command up from these guys right here up, it goes to their officers and then their theater commanders and then their secretaries of war in the Navy and then the President of the United States. There was no individual below the President who had simultaneous command over both the Army and the Navy. It made it very difficult to have joint operations. And here's the first time it comes up. This is early in 1862. And Lincoln says, Okay, let's figure this out. Let's see, it's an army weapon, so the army will supply the gun and the munitions and the supplies. Uh, the, they float, though, so the Navy will get a steamship and the men can be housed on that steamship when they're not busy taking care of the mortars. So you take charge of that and you take charge. This is the President of the United States. He even had a lieutenant specifically designated to be the go-between for all these guys. So from the White House, by telegraph, he's coordinating who's in charge of what in the middle of the Mississippi River. There was no existing protocol for doing it. So Lincoln said, I'll do it. Let's be practical about it. Let's just be pragmatic. We won't worry about the details of this or that or the other thing. We'll just make it happen. And that's another element of Lincoln's leadership. The gunboats, by the way, turned out to be pretty, pretty useful. Whoops, whoops, what happened here? In the middle, there it is. This is, uh, this is island number 10 in the Mississippi River. The Tennessee uh, line is right here. It actually divides two states in half. Uh, so the island number 10 is simply the 10th island down in numbered sequence from the confluence of the Ohio and the Mississippi Rivers. And the Confederates had uh, fortified it. The Union came down by river, and their original idea was, well, we'll land here on the coast, and we'll march overland to get it. But all of this you see here, this is swamp. And this real foot lake here goes for miles. To the, you cannot get around this corner, no matter how far you go. Well, what will we do then? How can we attack this? These are the mortar boats, these little dots right here. And they could fire over the top of that bend in the curve and pummel island number 10. Eventually, the, uh, the Union Navy ran past island number 10, picked up a force here, went down the river, landed here, and attacked from the rear. And that turned out to work. So Lincoln's management of the mortar boat problem helped to capture island number 10, opened the Mississippi River, and led to the campaign for Vicksburg. Absent Lincoln, might not have happened at all. The Army Navy would still be quarreling over who's going to feed those guys. All right. This is my favorite. This third example is my favorite one. It really shows you, I think, a lot about how Lincoln was willing to insert himself into circumstances where he could make a difference. This is a pretty busy little map. Let me work it out for you. What's going on? There's Washington, D.C. up here, is the Union capital. Here's Richmond, Virginia, the Confederate capital. And the Union general, George McClellan, had decided that rather than go down overland like this and try to cross all these rivers against offensive forces, he would put his army on ships 
and go down the Potomac River all the way down to here, land at uh, Hampton, Hampton Roads, and move toward Richmond that way. Well, okay, it's not a bad idea in concept. Um, but the problem was McClellan's not the guy to carry it out. Some of you who have studied the Civil War know that McClellan was not exactly champing at the bit to come to grips with the enemy. He was a, a little slow uh, in undertaking some of these operations. And it was so slow that Lincoln decided, I'm going to go down there and take a look. A little encouragement, do what I can. So he comes down by boat, got out into the Chesapeake Bay, immediately got seasick by the way, which is something I very much identify with. <laughs> Poor Abraham Lincoln. Came down, but he landed here at Hampton Roads and uh, woke up the next morning and he's on one of these big ships and he goes up on the deck, still slightly green. And the captain of the ship, Louis Goldsboro, who's actually in command of the whole squadron, says, Mr. President, let me give you a kind of tour of the area here. I'll show you what we're looking at. Here's Hampton Roads. Uh, and here they are on these ships looking around. And he says, uh, over here, this is Fortress Monroe. This is ours. We, got, we own this one. This is where we landed the troops. Here's where McClellan's army is bivouacked. Uh, over here at the tip of Newport News Point, this is where uh, the Merrimack, which the Union called the CSS Virginia, the big ironclad that the Confederates had built, had come out and sunk two ships, the Cumberland and the Congress. And over here, he said, these are Confederate batteries down here on the point. And Lincoln said, excuse me, Captain, could I ask you a question about this? Well, yes, Mr. President, of course you can. He said, those, those batteries down there, the Confederate batteries on Sewell's Point, are they within the range of your guns? Well, yes, Mr. President, they are. Have you shot at them? <laughs> well, no, we haven't because, you see, they would shoot back. And uh, it's generally not a good idea for ships that can sink to get into an engagement with a fort that can't. And Lincoln said, well, you might try that. Let's, let's see how this works out. So Lincoln went out to the Rip Raps, this little fort here, uh, originally called Fort Calhoun, now renamed Fort Wool for relatively obvious reasons, Calhoun being a, a secessionist, and watched while the Union fleet attacked Sewell's Point and pretty much wiped it out. Good, that's great. So Lincoln says, well, that's terrific. Uh, well, now I have another idea, uh, Captain. Oh, good. <laughs> yes, Mr. President, what is it? He says, well, I have an idea. Maybe you could land some troops, now that you've suppressed these batteries, land some troops here, and they could march overland, and you could capture Norfolk. <clears throat> and once you capture Norfolk, you see the Merrimack will no longer have a base, and we'll get control of their ironclad. Um, yeah, that, that could work, Mr. President. The, the problem is, let's see, what is the problem? The problem is that there's really not a good landing beach anywhere nearby. Uh, and we've never practiced amphibious landings. This would be an entirely new protocol. It's not in, our, it's not in my book here. Um, so Lincoln says, well, thank you. I appreciate that very much. So he got in a rowboat, did our friend President Lincoln, and uh, said, let me go see if I can find a beach. So here he is negotiating. The President of the United States and the Secretary of the Treasury. This is Trump and Mnuchin <laughs> in a rowboat negotiating the coast of Virginia. And they get right about to here, Ocean View, which is where a bunch of Navy housing is located today. And there's a very nice sloping landing beach there, unprotected. And Lincoln comes back and tells Goldsboro, guess what? I found a landing beach. Oh, good. Well, we'll look into that. We'll form a committee. We'll write a plan. Lincoln said, how about tomorrow morning, 4 o'clock? And they did. They gathered up these troops. They used boats that Lincoln had suggested, the old canal boats from the, what they wonderfully named, uh, uh, Dismal Swamp Canal. Uh, and those boats crossed Hampton Roads, landed in Ocean View, and the troops went ashore. Lincoln watched from offshore. There are a couple of, of uh, anecdotal elements that he went ashore with them. That turns out not to be true. But you know who did? The Secretary of the Treasury. Steve Mnuchin went ashore. <laughs> not likely. 
But uh, Salmon P. Chase did. And when he got to shore, he noticed that the army folks were kind of milling around. There didn't seem to be very much organization. Well, the general had warned them that we have no protocol for this sort of thing. And Seward went up to the commanding general and he said, General, why aren't your troops starting out on the road? I mean, we have an opportunity in front of us here. And he said, well, here's the problem. Um, the protocol is that the regiments must proceed in accordance with the seniority of the commanding officer of each regiment and we don't know the date of rank for all of the colonels so we don't know in which order to go. <laughs> to which Seward, not Seward, this is Chase, replied, um, General, let me make this relatively simple. In the name of the President of the United States, I order you to march immediately to Norfolk. Well, okay, we'll do it. So here they go down this road and they got here to Tunner's Creek and this little bridge right there. And on the other side of the bridge was a, uh, not a wagon, but you know, with a little canopy over the top, a, a carriage. And out of the carriage steps an elderly gentleman who begins to give a speech. It's the mayor of Norfolk with the key to the city. <laughs> oh, this is gonna be fairly easy after all. He's actually stalling, he's buying time so the Confederates can evacuate Norfolk with all that they can get away with and set fire to the Merrimack, which blew up. And then the army continued down and captured Norfolk with Lincoln watching. None of this would have happened had Lincoln not been there to oversee it, to suggest it, to prod it, to push it to its conclusion. So when you ever wonder, in the Monitor versus the Merrimack, it wasn't the Monitor that defeated the Merrimack. Who did? Abraham Lincoln did. On his way back, by the way, uh, there was on board the ship that Lincoln was occupying a reporter from the Washington Star newspaper who wrote out a column about how Lincoln had done all this and he actually showed it to the president. The president insisted that you take my name out of that. I did not do this. The soldiers and sailors who drove the ships and landed the men and marched to Norfolk, they did that. Talk about them. Take my name out of that article. Because he didn't want it to be about him. There's no ego investment in his management of this campaign. Yeah, we'll get to that. So what are the elements of Lincoln's leadership? Well, I'm gonna suggest there are four, three of which I've talked about, one of which I'll suggest in a minute. One is patience. Lincoln knew you don't have to respond immediately. You don't have to have a knee-jerk reaction to everything that happens. Sometimes you can wait out a problem. If you have more patience than your opponent, if you have more patience than the circumstances would generally allow, you can become master of the situation without having to confront it directly. He avoided war with Great Britain. He avoided alienating Charles Wilkes, a temporary popular hero. Um, by being patient. It's a rare, I want to say gift, but characteristic, uh, particularly I think among politicians, uh, but Lincoln had it and used it more than once. This is one of many examples. Uh, he was obviously very patient with McClellan. Many argue that he was too patient with McClellan, that, be that as it may. Another characteristic I'm gonna suggest was his pragmatism. When confronted with the question of who has authority, authorization over the, the gunboats and the mortar vessels in the Mississippi River, he didn't say the Army does or the Navy does. He said, I can do this. You know, we'll do this part and this part and we'll work it out. And, and those protocols gradually worked their way into the relationship between the Army and the Navy so that later at places like Vicksburg and Charleston, the Army and the Navy could and did work together because Lincoln had shown them how you could do this. There's a pragmatic, responsible, non-flashy ways of getting this done. The third one is, of course, uh, not only his willingness to step in and the pragmatism he demonstrated in coordinating the activities in and around Hampton Roads, but also his insistence that that wasn't about him. Right? His, his avoidance of making this a personal event. He's not ego-driven. And then the fourth one that I haven't mentioned yet, but I will now, is a sense of humor. You know, Lincoln's 
rather dry and often ribald sense of humor drove his foes crazy. They couldn't stand it. Uh, but it was a tool, too. You know, people would come into his office, and in those days, you just walked into the White House and said, I want to see the president. Oh, he's, he's over there. Uh, and they would come in, and they always had something to ask for. I need this, or you should do that, or how come you haven't done this? And Lincoln would listen, and he would nod and thank him very much for coming, and he would say, you know what? That reminds me of a story. <laughs> and then he'd tell the story. And he'd laugh at his own jokes. He'd double over and slap his knees, ah, ha, ha, and stand up. Well, of course, then the visitor did too. And he'd throw his arms around the visitor, and they'd walk out chuckling, and Lincoln would close the door, and the fellow would be halfway down the hall and say, hey, wait a minute, what was the answer? Uh, what? Um, all of his jokes had a point. They weren't just jokes, because when people came to him with problems, it really did remind him of a story. And that reminds me of a story, one that Lincoln told more than once. Um, this involved a time when Lincoln was uh, riding circuit uh, in Illinois. He was a lawyer, country lawyer, as his foes called him, out in Illinois. And he and Judge Douglas, who we always call Judge Douglas, uh, Stephen Douglas, who of course became his opponent in two Senate races and a presidential race, um, were nevertheless friends and used to travel together. They'd go to a town, set up a local, and everybody would bring their accumulated court cases, and the, the judge would preside, Douglas would preside, and Lincoln and the other lawyers who traveled in a group would kind of flip a coin, whose who's offense, whose defense, and they would take charge. And this was a case where Lincoln uh, had to defend uh, someone from a, it almost doesn't matter, a, an event, because his opposing attorney got up in front of that six-man jury and said, gentlemen of the jury, you absolutely must find this person guilty because of the facts. The facts are he had motive. The fact is he had opportunity. The fact is that somebody saw him. The fact, and so on. Tick, 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 tick. Sat down, pretty effective. And Lincoln got up, unfolding himself from his seat, walking up in front of him. And of course, Lincoln had this kind of Kentucky patois that I, I'll try not to emulate too much, but you have to imagine a little twang in this. He says, well, now, facts are certainly important things, especially in a case like this. But you know, facts, facts have a life of their own, and that reminds me of a story. Seems there was this farmer out, and of course he'd make it some local community where it took place, and he had to get in his hay crop. And as you all know, you have to hire extra hands to do that because it's a big job. So, so he hired a handyman, a local man, a fella, to come help him get in the crop. And, and uh, he had a teenage daughter and a younger son, and they were all working like crazy. And the farmer happened to be in the house when his little boy came running in. He said, Pa, Pa, we got terrible trouble. And he said, what is it, son? What's the matter? And he said, well, it's, it's Sis and the handyman. They're out in the barn. And sis, she's got her dress pulled up like this, and the handyman, he has his pants pulled down like this. Pa, they're fixing to pee on our hay. <laughs> to which Lincoln said, which suggests that you may have all the facts and still come to the wrong conclusion. <laughs> and he won the case. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. <laughs>